Okay. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you've all settled in for the afternoon and, and uh, had a good lunch and everyone is safe and, and healthy. Um, another exciting YSA virtual online lesson this afternoon, and I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Tammy Richardson. We can okay. say Dr. Tammy. Yeah, that's so fine. Unmute and clap your yeah, hands. Yeah. So, Tammy, <laughs> how are things in Hello. South Carolina, Columbia, or well? Yeah, so we're in, I'm in Columbia, South Carolina, and I'm a professor at the University of South Carolina. We are in the middle of the state, so we're not even on the ocean, but we uh, have a field lab that is on the ocean, and I get to go there sometimes. And uh, I teach marine science. Uh, this semester, I'm teaching a course in phytoplankton ecology, so it's maybe uh, pertinent for the day. Yes. And yeah, things are good. It's hot, it's sunny, it's beautiful, except we're all stuck at home. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's going stir crazy. Well, hopefully, you're getting out and about. And so, we had a project together, what, a decade ago? Oh my heavens, I know. So well started in 2012, I think, so. Yes. Wow, yeah, a long and time. I, totally did. I saw a picture on Facebook the other day where we're chatting about something walking down an old railway trail. Yes, so, yep, you're headed into town, I think. Yes. Yep. So, that, wasn't all, that great? All of the students at, at YSA will be familiar with the jars of jellies and plankton around the room. So Good, okay, awesome. That's going to talk to us a little bit about this today, but. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I have a couple of jelly pictures, but that's it. But I do have, Cyrus and Scott, some pictures of Rob in action. So oh, no. uh, he doesn't know this, but I have. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, All no. right. So there we go. Okay. Yeah, so let, so let the embarrassment go ahead. Go. I'll let you. Uh, All right. I'll go yeah. ahead and share my screen and start out here. So some of this is going to be really simple, guys, and it's maybe things that you already know. So just bear, bear with me. All right. But again, feel free to interrupt me whenever you want. Um, so the, one of the things that I do, one of the things, of the things I do as a scientist is I study plankton. And one of the things I really like to think about is what is the role of plankton in marine food webs? Um, so most of the time when I go places and talk to school kids that are in school, big kids and small kids, um, whenever I say the word plankton, they always think of this guy, right? This by, the guy from SpongeBob, and especially the little ones. They maybe have heard of plankton, but I tell them, no, no, that's not really what I'm, I, I study, but uh, I study different plankton. But you guys may have seen these definitions already. I don't know. Um, plankton, the word means, it comes from the Greek meaning planktos, which means wandering or drifting. And these are the animals and, and plants in the ocean that really they do not swim strongly at all. They get uh, moved around by the ocean currents. So the ones that I specialize in are the phytoplankton, the ones that are, we call them plants, they're not really, they're really unicellular organisms called protists, but we'll pretend that they're plants. That's why I put that in, um, in quotation marks. And for me, the most important feature of them is that they're, they do photosynthesis, they're photosynthetic. And so as you'll see in just a second, they are, um, the base of, of almost all the aquatic food webs. And Dr. Rob, he, he studies the zooplankton, those are the animal plankton, and those are the enemies of my phytoplankton. Eat my phytoplankton, they are the heterotrophs, they have to eat something in order to survive. So we have an, an, an immediate competition here between the, the Dr. Rob and Dr. Tammy specializing uh, specialists in life. So the phytoplankton, <laughs> phytoplankton, you know, I first fell in love with these when I looked through the microscope and saw all of the different sizes and shapes and colors. Um, they can have, they can be long chains like this cyanobacterium here. They can be green in color. They can be brown in color. They can be colorless. Um, they may have flagellae like you see here. Um, they may, let's see, they may have, oh, there's some more flagella. This is one that I currently have growing. This is just a sketch of a, a phytoplankton called Rhodomonas. But because they're photosynthetic, these guys form the base of almost all aquatic food webs. They are what fuels higher level productivity in the ocean. I like to tell my, my marine science uh, freshman students that, you know, guys, you wouldn't have sea turtles or whales or any of the creatures that you guys all love you know, dolphins, all those things we call charismatic megafauna, if it weren't for my friends, the phytoplankton. 
The, um, I mentioned already they're photosynthetic. If you remember from school, the really basic equation for photosynthesis where carbon dioxide and water and light energy are combined to form some kind of carbohydrate or glucose, maybe you called it sugar, and oxygen is released by that reaction. I always like to tell people that for every second breath you take, thank the phytoplankton because they are responsible for at least 50% of the oxygen that we breathe. And of course, the other 50% comes from um, land plants, right? So they're the ocean sort of plants that produce oxygen. And most importantly for marine organisms, they're the ones that fix carbon from being in the air to being in an actual molecule that organisms can eat. So these pictures at the top, or these ones here, I mean, these cells here are, are very small. So these ones, yeah. So that's what, yes. Yeah. So I was going to show them over here. So this one would be about, uh, I don't know, have you guys done sizes yet? We, we have. Actually, yeah, we, we went okay, all good. the way down to femtograms. Uh, so so this, this, this guy here up on the top left, it's a dinoflagellate. And probably from the left side to the right side, he's probably 40 micrometers. So 40 times 10 to the minus 6 meters, 40 millionths of a meter, pretty small. Um, these guys down here, these are called cryptophytes. They're on the order of 15 microns in width and maybe, I don't know, 25 in length. So they're all pretty small. And I say they're, they're all different shapes and sizes, but um, the one thing they have in common is you have to use a microscope to see them, all right? So yeah, I just, they're, they're really a nice diversity in terms of uh, what they look like if you look at them under the microscope. If you look at them in real life, um, in real life, if you look at them in a bottle, they just look different colors. It doesn't look very exciting at all, right? So it's, it's, it's more fun to see them through the microscope because you can see their, their beautiful shapes and sizes and different colors. So I, I just ordered a compound scope. Did you? Good. Awesome. Yes. So we'll be able, we, we have a lake in Wilmington called Greenfield Lake. Yeah. And um, it, it's full of like nutrients, right? And yeah. Every summer there's like algal growth there. And yeah. Is it cyanobacteria or do you know what it is? It's a cyanobacteria, yeah. Good. This would uh, be like, so the one that I had in these slides is this one here yep. is Anabina. And yep. it's one that you might find in a, in a brackish pond. This one makes a toxin, but you can tell it because it's got, it looks like a string of pearls with bigger pearls every once in a while. It'll look like that under the scope. So that might be one you see. Yes. You never know, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. So have you guys talked about diatoms at all? Okay, we have not. Okay, good. Well, diatoms are a really common um, type of phytoplankton that you would find in freshwater, in, in estuaries, or in marine environments. Um, they can, again, they form these beautiful, each one of these cells is, well, these, this is a pretty big one. This is probably like 60 microns across. Um, but the neat part about the diatoms is they make their cell walls out of silica. So it means that they, oh, we have, we have another person with us. This is good. It means that they have, um, they literally live in little, glass houses. They have uh, glass as their outer covering. So you can see right through them and into the middle. So this one here down in the bottom right corner, you can see all those little tiny things are called chloroplasts. And those are where all of the photosynthetic machinery of the cell uh, exists. But it's nice that you can, because it's clear glass, you can see right through the cell wall and into the diatom interior. All right. So those are, that's one really common type of, of um, phytoplankton, no matter where you where you live. Have you Another been to um, Miami airport before? Tell me. I have, yeah. Yeah, so you know the American terminal? Yeah, Did I you haven't been there anything? for a long time. But... Have, have you noticed anything about the floor? It's got oh. diatom designs all over the floor. Is it really? Yeah, I don't I'm know. Gonna find a yeah, I've probably not been to the American terminal. I don't, I, don't even, I don't remember. It's been a while since I've been there. Oh, that's cool. Do they really? Yes. You're a Delta flyer, aren't you? I, yeah, I was. And now I'm American more, but it depends where I'm going. <laughs> That's funny. So yeah, these they're they're quite beautiful. Again, they can be they can be colonies like this one here. They can be just single cells. There's all sorts of taxonomic detail we could go into, but the the bottom line is they're again they're relatively big. A lot of them. For, uh, as far as phytoplankton go, and they have this outer cell wall that's made of of glass. Um, the dinoflagellates are another group that you guys might 
run into at some point. Uh, I love these. The die part means two, and the flagellate part means flagellate, <laughs> means flagellum. And let's see, we've got somebody. Ah, very good, Rob. Um, the idea is that these skis can swim up and down in the water, and a lot of them are uh, cause what we call harmful algal blooms or red tides. I don't know if you've talked about that yet, um, but there again, another quite a beautiful, uh, over here on the left is an artist's sketch of what some different dinoflagellates look like, but they're all, they're kind of creepy. Uh, the little, the kindergarten kids that I, I teach uh, sometimes with these lectures, they tell me they look like aliens, and I, I think I agree, right? You think they look like aliens a little bit? There's a scale bar on this one, this photo, and that says 20 micrometers, so 20 microns. So this particular species called peridinium, peridinium is big. It's about 180 to 100 microns in size. And again, big is relative, right? It's big for a phytoplankton. It's small compared to humans. Let's put it that way. Um, I often say that if you took a dime and mm -hmm. you sliced it a thousand times crossway, oh, good, yeah, yeah. Each thickness of that slice of that dime is it's more or less is about a micron. So if you put yeah. 20 yep. of those together, then perfect. Be the size of that particular. Perfect. Scale. I like it. If you slice it in what? How many pieces? A thousand times. A thousand times. Okay. Yeah. That's good. That's a good. That's a good record. Park. Yeah. 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 I know. Plus or minus. Um, the other neat thing about the dinoflagellates, and this is what a lot of my students have noticed, because a lot of them come from coastal areas in South Carolina and other other states, is that some of the dinoflagellates are responsible for the phenomenon we call bioluminescence. In other words, they will glow if you if you irritate them okay so if you're in a boat and you happen to be driving along in the water and you look behind you at night you might see some glowing bits in the water and these are these are the bioluminescent diatoms and so oh there we go so here's a one called goniolex polyhedra that's showing it glowing and on the right hand side there's a little animation of bioluminescence by um, a peridinium or a protoperidinium so if you, what causes them to, to luminesce, you can stimulate luminescence from mechanical stimulation. So if you're driving through water in your boat, you can make these things glow. You can add acid to the water and they will, some dinoflagellates will, they will get a little bit confused and they glow continuously. And sometimes, so goniolux, for example, if you, if you lower the temperature, they will then also start to do this luminescence. Um, the luminescence in dinoflagellates, okay, so here's a question for the students. Do you know anything in nature in your neighborhood uh, that you might see in the summertime normally that will do, a, that will glow in the dark? Have you ever seen anything glow in the dark? The firefly. The fireflies, absolutely, Scott, good job. Well, you know, the enzymes that are in the dinoflagellates um, are, are luciferases, and it's exactly the same type of enzyme, sy enzyme system that the, the fireflies have. So it's, it's, uh, it's kind of neat to see how this has uh, the similarities between fireflies and dinoflagellates, because you wouldn't think they really had that much in common. Good. And also next, next week, Tammy, this, mm -hmm. this time next week, we have um, Steve Haddock from Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Do you? Yes, Steve, he's going to be joining us, and I know he's going to be talking about deep sea bioluminescence. Oh, fantastic! Yes. Because that's yeah, that's it's, I don't know if those if those systems are the same. They probably are. I haven't looked at those. That's a good question. You can ask Dr. Steve if whether or not the uh, the glowing is the same thing that happens in fireflies. We'll see yes. what he says. Yeah, very good. That sounds like fun. All right, let's see. Oh, here's a really big a big ugly diagram. All right, this is, this is my life, pretty much. Food webs. So one of the, this is, I'm just gonna talk about a little piece of this. This is one, a photo that I use for my, uh, well, all of my classes really, because we talk about uh, different parts of this diagram in biological oceanography. But the one that I want to point to you, out to you, is that, whoops, is that the, phy the photosynthesis by my friends, the phytoplankton, one of the really important things it does is it takes up carbon dioxide and it removes it from the surface of the ocean. 
So if you're interested in things like global climate change and temperature uh, increasing in the world because of, of climate change, the phytoplankton are an incredibly important uh, way that we actually will, can get rid of carbon dioxide because they take it up during photosynthesis, they repackage it, and maybe they get eaten by something or they sink to deeper water, and that carbon hopefully will get buried in way down deep in the marine sediments. So this is what I'm showing you here. So that, that's, that's a whole course in itself, a whole class in itself. But one, the, one of the big reasons that I'm interested in phytoplankton is, is because of the fact that they photosynthesize and they remove carbon from the surface of the ocean. So that's maybe a nut lesson for another time, Rob. We've, we've dabbled a bit actually in the biological pump. And good. Um, well, that's the other it thing right there. Is to put that last <laughs> diagram into context. So, Tammy, we have a, um, a weather balloon project where mm -hmm. we're developing technology and we launch the balloon up to the stratosphere. So, 100 oh, feet above Earth and it's got cameras. Yeah. We've been fitting sensors on Raspberry Pis. So, what, one of the things that we're looking at doing is start measuring some gases because we've got temperature and pressure yeah. and things like that figured out. Oh, so carbon right. dioxide is one of those. Okay, well, we'll very good. Well, there's lots of it in the atmosphere, so hopefully you'll be able to measure yes. it. <laughs> very good. Very good. All right, so moving on in our, in our food web of life here are the enemies of the phytoplankton, and of course those are the zooplankton. And so I just have, this is a slide that I show to the little kids because this is, these are definitely ones that the, the kindergarten kids say, ooh, they look like, definitely look like aliens. But for example, here I have some diatoms that might get eaten by our friend, the copepod. Have you talked about copepods yet? Okay, good. And that, the copepod is actually the model for plankton in SpongeBob. So they have a little bit in common. They have the eye spot and he has big eyeballs, which real plankton don't have, you know that, right? And certainly real plankton don't have tongue or teeth, but they have these long antennae with these beautiful little cite on them that help them detect um, electrical and vibrational impulses from in the water. This one on the right I love especially, and I, because you can see phytoplankton inside this organism, and I'm not gonna tell you what it is just yet, you might know already, but you can see the green algal material in the gut. And then I love this, so, and then it turns kind of yellow as you get down through the digestive system. So students, what, what is that thing, what is he, what is this yellow brownish bit inside this, this zooplankton? I'll, I'll ask Cynthia or David, do you guys know? Oh. She's gone shy. Anyone? Cyrus? Oh, come on. The kindergarten kids say it. Poop. Just say it. <laughs> <laughs> I say it and they all laugh. It's fecal material, people. No, it's, it's just poop, people. Zooplankton people love to talk about poop. I don't know if Dr. Rob does, but anybody I know, they often talk about, about fecal pellets. But we'll talk more about that maybe later. All right. But there, again, all sorts of different shapes and sizes. And there's two main groups. Have you done these, Dr. Rob? Uh, I have not. Excellent. I'm just trying to see what I'm repeating and not. Oh, so good. there's two kinds of plankton. There's holoplankton and meroplankton. And what I tell my students is holoplankton are plankton that are planktonic for the holo of their life. And meroplankton are plankton that are planktonic for merely part of their life. And I don't know if that'll help you remember. But for example, if we look right here at the top, Top, there's some different developmental stages of the copepods. Copepods are planktonic for their whole life. When they become an adult, they're still in the plankton. They're still at the mercy of the currents. Where meroplankton may be planktonic as a juvenile, but they become maybe something that is attached to a rock or something that can swim like a crab or a shrimp as they get older. So we're going to look at that for just a little bit. And I've got more examples here. So here's our friend, the copepod, about a half a millimeter length. Um, copepods account for about 70% of all of zooplankton biomass in the ocean. So there's a lot of them out there. Generally, they're pretty big. They have this beautiful eye spot again, and these antennae. And these, are these would be part of the holoplankton because they're always planktonic. 
This particular species is about the size of the lead of a pencil in length, so that gives you a feel. This is a pretty big one, right? This is a relatively large one. And they have all sorts of nifty appendages that they use to sweep the water free of plankton particles, so phytoplankton. Um, this is a big one called Eucalinus pileatus. Uh, Rob, have you seen this one, this video before? Yeah, actually, uh, Deb. Deb had it. Yeah, she probably uses it too. Yeah. So, a, a scientist by the name of Rudy Strickler yes. filmed this, this particular organism feeding, and he tethered this with a little bit of glue and a dog hair to a petri dish. That's the story I've heard. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but that he used the hair from his dog to tether this so that he could make it stay still. And all he wanted to see were, were the appendages moving. But you can see their feeding appendages sweeping. They have these big, long um, projections on their appendages that allow them to sweep the water free of particles. So that's a, I love watching it. I just kind of- Yeah, me too. Yeah. And actually, I, did, I remember this video from grad school. This is the, the one that really made me think about physics. And how- Is it? Yeah. Physics yep. and like, how, how copepods are really unique in that they live in a sort of rough, turbulent environment, but they can manipulate the water so yeah. that when they feed, it's like pulling stuff out of like a pot of honey in a viscous world. Honey, that's right. Absolutely. Yeah, they oh, live at low Reynolds numbers, it's called. Yes, right? my, yeah. my uh, uh, students are sick of me saying physics controls everything. But uh, it's, it's physics so kind of does in the ocean anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Or at least fluid dynamics, right? <laughs> fluid mechanics, I don't know. All right. Okay, so here's one. Students, anybody want to guess what this guy is? Everyone should know this. We had this last week. Excellent. Well, what is it? It's a shrimp. It's related to a shrimp, but it's a special shrimp that, they, that you may find in Antarctica. Anybody remember? Starts with K and ends with Rill. Put that together. Krill. Krill, right, exactly. <laughs> All right. The, the genus and species of this is Euphausia superba. I love that. You have to say it with an Italian accent and wave your arms, right? Um, keystone species in the Antarctic. This is uh, whale food, fish food, squid food whole bunch of them they they eat diatoms but they get eaten by a whole bunch of other critters very good i like that all right so krill is another example of the holoplankton they're always planktonic then we have our friends the miroplankton and these are the i personally love these guys because they just look weird um so i'm going to show you a couple of those let's let's do this one first does anyone want to guess what this critter and no it's the answer is not spider okay i'll tell you that right off anybody want to guess please what this might grow into when it's older and marine it's a marine a invertebrate go ahead a crab a oh you're, you're really close lobster mm -hmm. yeah lobster there we go and i actually i think it's a spiny lobster but, and that's not a spiny lobster, but I like the way he was waving, so I used the, the, the picture anyway. Good. So that is a larval lobster. Um, a pretty advanced, it's a long word that starts with P, and I never remember what. Rob, what's the stage? Philo? Uh, Phyllosoma. Phyllosoma. There we go. Phyllosoma stage that eventually will settle down and become part of the benthic animal kingdom, and that's this guy, the lobster. All right, here's another one. Let's see. Oh, actually, go back. Go back. There's one more thing that's really cool about this. This critter, this photo? you notice that there's a jelly there as well. So you, you find um, this larva actually on top of the jellyfish. And do you really? Yes, you do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And they have an adaptation. Their mouth part is adapted to biting into gelatinous tissue. Yeah. Their gut has special sort of muscle around it, mm -hmm. parts that can actually pump through sort of soft gelatinous tissue. I did not know that. They so they eat the smaller jellies. Eat, yeah, they completely eat um, gelatinous animals. Well, we'll keep, there you go. All there right. you go. I learned, I told you, I, I love this job. You learn something new. That's every right. Day, right? All right. So here's another one. Now, I showed you this guy earlier before, and I went really fast by the slide that had the answer. 
but this is the, the larval form of something that you might recognize, but it doesn't look anything like this in the adult. Anybody want to guess? Just throw out anything. I don't mind if it's wrong. How about a whale? You think it might be a whale? <laughs> what are those? Anybody know? Barnacles? Have you, have you done barnacles before? No, Cyrus says clam, but. Oh, that's okay. That's close. Clams. Oh, Anybody else want to guess? They're kind of grossing me out. I can't look at them. Okay. Okay. That's fair. They are kind of gross. They're not very big, though. They're only like, oh, I don't know, maybe half a centimeter across. They are kind of. Uh, like no, barnacles. No, barnacles. Barnacles. It is barnacles. <laughs> I think I think Cynthia was disagreeing with David, but Cynthia is correct. They are barnacles. They are I hate barnacles. things that have those like small holes in them. Well, yeah, you know what? That's called the operculum. That's their little that's a little trap door that when that opens, it, it becomes I don't know. Can you guys you can see me? Also. <laughs> when that trap door opens, this little thing comes out called Siri and it waves and it pulls in food. And all sorts of things. It looks like this. Somewhere I have an animation, but they're much more interesting when they're open. But you know, they're really well adapted for the intertidal region because they can close that trap door and they can seal themselves in and they don't dry out. And they're really hard and crusty. So nothing, not many things like to eat them. I can't even think of what a natural predator, birds maybe, but that's about it. Um, there yeah. might be some gastropods that can grind them. Could burrow in. Uh, yeah. Cotton probably. Yeah. Oh, the chitin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, they're they're pretty ugly. I'll I'll, go, I'll agree with you there. But All right, we'll move away from the ugliness then. How's that? We're moving up the food web now. And the uh, small animals, the really tiny things are food for slightly bigger animals in the ocean. What are these on the left-hand side? Anybody know? Squid. Squid. Awesome. And, okay, I'm going to call these fish because I don't know what they are. Do, Rob, you know what species they are? They're just, they're uh, just pretty fish. Yeah, they're pretty fish, yes. We'll move along really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> they get eaten by the larger animals. Okay, here's a nice, oh, isn't that one beautiful? What is that? Cyrus or Scott or who do I have? Cynthia and? A jellyfish. They're, that's a jelly. What kind is it, Rob? Do you know? A choria. Aquaria, okay, very good. What's this one, anybody? Sea turtle. Sea turtle. turtle, excellent. And if I can see him, it's probably a green. I can't see his back, but. Yeah. And then a fish, a fish, Jack the fish, a regular fish. It is a fish. tuna. It is a tuna. And which, what kind of fin is it? Bluefin. Look at the color. Yellowfin, sorry. Yellowfin, excellent, excellent. You, know you guys did a better job at that than most of my marine science university students. They just go, yeah, it's a fish. <laughs> and I tell them it comes in a can and they go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So let me tell you something. And this is what I think you guys maybe know this already. But did you know that the largest of the whales, the skates and rays, and the sharks, all feed on plankton. They are not predators. So I love to show this picture because it's a really nice um, scaled image of, I'm gonna move you guys up to the top here, of, whoops, hello, um, of different types of whales that we find in the ocean. But the largest, of course, is our friend the blue whale. They have a scale bar here of approximately 100 feet long. But all of these guys, known as the baleen whales, the blue, the finback, the right whale, the say, the humpback, the gray whale, and the minke, those are the biggest of the whales, and every single one of those feeds on plankton. Over here on the right, we have the predator, the non, uh, sorry, the non-planktivorous whales, okay, the toothed whales, and for example, here's orca, the killer whale down here on the bottom. Look how small he is compared to the blue whale, all right, relatively speaking. And so what that tells you is that, and there's the bottlenose dolphin, the white whale, the beluga. What that tells you is that feeding on plankton is really, really efficient. There's a lot of them in the water. 
And these guys lit swim literally and will open their mouths periodically and filter those plankton out of the water. But they don't have to do a lot of, they don't do a lot of hunting. So they don't waste a lot of energy um, looking for prey and then maybe losing it, right? So generally speaking, the largest of the species are all the plankton feeders and the smaller of the species are um, the tooth whales the, are the ones that prey or that are predators on other other organisms. Oops. Yeah, okay, what's this? Is oh, this your favorite? My favorite? One of them, yeah. Yeah. What is this? Students, anybody know? A whale shark. It's a whale shark. Has anybody ever seen a whale shark, even in an aquarium? I have not. Yes. I would love to see one. Where'd you see it, Scott? In an aquarium somewhere? He's on mute. I, I have not seen one, but I have not either. Has anybody, if you've been to Atlanta, to the aquarium in Atlanta, they have yeah. one there. Yeah. But, um... I went to one in Seattle mm -hmm. and it was in a fenced off area in the actual ocean. Oh, that, that's neat. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I would love to see one, but I think they're quite beautiful. And, you know, you can see they're quite harmless because we are not plankton. Well, hopefully. All right, let's talk. The last little bit here I want to talk about is how do you catch plankton? Um, and my, I like to show this and tell people that that's my son, Jacob, but I don't really do that to Jacob, I promise. But if you want to catch pl plankton, it's not like catching a fish. You can't use a rod and reel and a fly or maybe some kind of bait. You have to use something. Um, let's see. So generally, you need to have a boat. So maybe a small boat like this one or maybe a big ship like this one. Uh, this is one called the RV, Research Vessel Cape Hatteras, that used to be, used to belong to UNC and Duke. Now, it just got retired a few years ago, so it's not in, it's been sold and it's doing another job these days. But that was the very first large ship that I ever went on, and that, I love that ship. This is another one that I've been on. It's called the RV Kayo. Um, it's owned by the Japanese Marine Science and Technology Center in Japan. That's their government agency, be like our... NOAA or National Marine Fisheries Service. I've been, I've been to one of their main buildings. It's, it's beautiful. What, the, the Jamstack buildings? Yeah. How I've do you really there. think? Oh, it's I can really imagine because these guys, I mean, they had high tech everything. This is a dual yeah. hold um, swath vessel. It's got a hole in the middle that they fire a laser, can fire a laser down through. And at night they light up all the jellies in the ocean and you can see them because, oh no, it's really cool. Um, I spent two weeks on this one. This is the biggest one I've ever been on. It's about 202 feet. Um, but the neat part is it caps, not neat. The interesting part is it capsizes in <sighs> that are over three meters, three to four meters. So it's only good in water that's really, really calm. Mm. Um, but it's, nobody ties anything down. Rob, it's really fascinating to be on this thing because they looked at me like I was insane when I started duct taping things to the, you know, to the table and things like that. But anyway. What were you doing on, on the, the Japanese? On the Kayo? Um, I was, it was when I was a graduate student, and I was, um, Marlon Lewis had a project with one of the Japanese um, scientists, and he brought me along to measure primary productivity. So I did C13 primary productivity. Um, we had one station a day, and we went on a transect from the Marshall Islands um, down to the equator and along the equator, and then back up to Palau. Yeah. So, yeah, it was really neat. It was yeah. really it was just incredible. And I, I put a link. Um, I had taken some video from one of the Trophic Bats cruises. Okay. And, yep. um, you'll see Bridget actually in there doing some. Oh, fantastic. Good. Okay. All so right. Everyone should look at the video. All right. On, on that. Well, this, this is the one that, that the ship that we spent lots of time on, Rob, the, the Atlantic Explorer. Yep. This is out of Bermuda. And it's, it's also a fairly large ship. We spent what, two weeks at a time on it, more or less, that yep. we left Bermuda and explored different parts of the North Atlantic. Um, so again, you know, you need a ship to go study plankton or you at least need a small boat. All of these ships I'm showing you are designed to spend fairly long periods of time on um, and to go a fairly long distance. So in order to catch your plankton, you need to have bottles or some kind of net. So I'm gonna start with bottles. Uh, in my case, for the phytoplankton, they're so small that we can use these gray bottles to capture them at different depths in the ocean. And if you look really closely, you can see 
that the top of this bottle goes into the water. When it goes into the water, it's open, both at the top, and then you can see down here, and at the bottom. So each of them is cocked open, and then when you get to whatever depth you want to capture water at, you can tell the computer, close the bottle, and the top and the bottom snap shut. So you can trap water at many, many different depths in the ocean. Um, you need a big crane to put this. This is a really heavy, uh, lots of bottles, and there's all sorts of instrumentation in here in the bottom. There's a light meter on top somewhere. I don't actually see it, but it measures light. And under here, there's different sensors that measure oxygen and fluorescence and, and probably conductivity, so you can get salinity, all sorts of different sensors underneath. And then this big silver thing here is a crane that literally we lower in this direction and it goes out over the water and then we lower this package of instruments into the water. So that's the, the bottle capture. Once we have our captured water, we can take it into the lab. So these are all, of, this is the same ship, the Atlantic Explorer. There's our friend Doug, who's running nutrients. And again, you can see we've taped down all of the, um, or use bungee cords to strap everything to the, to the table so that when the waves action gets high, it doesn't fall off. Um, here's some of the bottles that we collect from the other gray bottles. And there's my student, Eric, working hard in the lab. And this is one of the undergraduate students, Steve, who was doing some experiments on deck. So he was floating some bottles in this little contraption that he flowed seawater through. So those are just different views of the labs that we worked in, in on the ship. So I said you needed a bottle or you needed a net. Well, if you're on a small boat, you can maybe use your own small net like this lady here. This is one of, um, Rob, this is Erla Olof's daughter. She was one of Jay's PhD students. And she's now back in Iceland running some marine institute in, in Reykjavik. Wow. So if you ever go to Iceland, you can look up, look up Erla. But that's her, Erla sampling um, with a small plankton net. But on the Explorer, because we had a big ship and we had a crane, we could use a really big plankton net. And that's probably what is it a meter by a meter, Rob? Or yeah, it is. How, yeah. How big it is. And yeah. so students, if you look closely, this gentleman right oh, here my. with the blue hat on would be your fearless leader, Dr. Rob. Do you have more hair than Rob? I don't know, there he is. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> I don't look too bad there. Just the same. And then there's a shot of when the net comes up after having towed for plankton. What Dr. Rob is doing here is he's, he's taking the bottle that you collect those things in and he's, he's unscrewing it from the bottom of the net so that they can then take it into the lab. And you might pour it in a, a a container like this and watch things swimming around. Let's see. I had, I tried to make this a video. I don't know if it's going to work. Let me see. Oh, it might. Let's, oh, yes. Now, I think it's going to work. Yeah. Mostly what you're going to hear is boat noise. So students, I want you to take, take a, have a, get a feel for how loud it is on these ships sometimes. I hope this works. Let's see. And what I wanted you to see was things swimming around here, which you sort of can. Here we go. That's what they look like when you take them out of, off of the net and put them in some water. And it's very unexciting. All it is is copepods swimming in boat noise. Ooh, very exciting. <laughs> so but that's how loud it is out there, right? It is. It's surprisingly a lot of like noise out there. Absolutely. And you get yeah. off the ship and you're rocking and you know you. Oh yeah. And you, you know, ears are oh, they work again. Yeah, Look at yeah. that. Okay. So. Um, um, Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say that, um, so we do a lot of sort of plankton toes in the Cape Fear River. Good. It's actually, it's actually surprising that there aren't many freshwater plankton folks in the world. Yeah, you know, I think you're right. I mean, most of them yeah. I know work on Daphne or something. That's, that, that's exactly right, but this yeah. Cape Fear, it's beautiful. I mean, there's yeah. so much diversity, but the, did, I'm just going to ask my, my students that are online here, did you notice how... It, the water was so clear and there didn't seem to be a lot of plankton swimming around, right? Yet we, we put the net in for 30 seconds, one minute in the river and it's comp or in the lake and it's oh completely it full, chock full yeah. of, of life. It's Neat. Yes. Yeah, that was an exciting tow for the oligotrophic open ocean, right? It's <laughs> oh, very exciting. Yeah, very exciting. I mean, exactly. sometimes we're putting the net in for what? 
20 minutes, half an oh, hour. Oh, yeah. So, I know. I don't remember how long that tow was. I just remember coming into the lab and going, oh, I need to get a video of this for my class. <laughs> That's good stuff. <laughs> my favorites to, to catch are the are the gooseberries. I don't know. Do they have freshwater gooseberries? Sea gooseberries? I don't know. Freshwater no, they don't. They're all marine, I think. Yeah, and then the the salps. They're my. I love. I love seeing the gelatinous critters. And this is maybe ones that Rob's talked about already. Um, oh wait, somewhere I had a picture that I wanted to ask you about. Wait, ooh, ooh, ooh. where did that go? I might have gotten rid of it. There was a. I, I ran across a photo. Of, a, of an organism that would look like a fish, but it was long and clear, and it was one that you guys got in oh. a tow one day. What was that? Yeah, so I actually have that in at YSA, this um, Alas Cyrus or Cynthia, and it's got a little shell on the back. Do you know mm -hmm. what that's called? It starts with H. It's a, it's a heteropod. A heteropod, okay. Heteropod. Oh, well, there it is, wait. Yeah. Is that it? What is oh, that? No. Okay, no, no. That, that's, okay, does anyone know what this is? We were actually just talking about this before we. I couldn't so, remember. This, it's, it's a larval eel. Ah, that's it. Is that a glass eel? Right. Yeah, right so right, right. this is the this is the larval stage, and so the adults will swim from places like the Cape Fear River. And right, they go all the way out to the Sagasa Sea, yep. reproduce, and the larvae will eventually swim all the way back to the to the coast. To the home. Well, and the, and but the British the British eels do that too, right? They breed yep. in the same area. Yep. So is that a, that's for sure an American eel? Oh, I'm not actually. I'm not sure if that's an American eel. But ah, there we go. Yes, this, this is good to know. It's so because you know what? I I just started a unit on that. In I teach um, biology of marine organisms and marine science three eleven. And I didn't realize that I actually possessed a picture of a glass eel. So there we are. Okay. Again, see, I've learned two things so far at least. <laughs> All right, let's have a look. No, 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 no more. All right, just wanted to show the, the gang some maybe some bigger gnats that they wouldn't have run into yet. Um, on the left here is something called a bongo net. And I don't know if you've ever seen bongo drums, but there's two drums and you can beat them and make great noise. They're a lot of fun. So this would be two nets that you would tow side by side. And then this one I think is really cool. It's called a mock nest. And it sounds like something, a monster from the deep, but it stands for what? Multiple opening and closing, dooby 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 Uh Yes, <laughs> something sick. <different. laughs> right? yeah. Have you used one of these, mock nests? So the, so the mock nest, so, so I've shown, I've lived here, there's nine different nets. See, and they're attached by the tops and the bottoms. Have you guys talked about these? No, I haven't. Oh, good. Okay. I've never seen one work, and I would love to someday. Yeah, so I've used it off Hawaii before. On oh, yeah? On the cruises. Yeah. It's cool. complex. Very I complex. bet it is. Because there's, um, so the student, if you can see students, there's nine nets that you drop one by one by one. You open them and tow, and then you close it. And then you open the next one and you tow for a while and then you close it. And so you can do that nine different times. And up here on the top, there's all sorts of other sensors that can report what depth you're at and what temperature the water is and how long you've towed for and how far you've traveled. So you can calculate the volume of water that goes through that net. So you can then figure out the concentration of organisms that you capture in your net. So that's kind of, I, I love these. I'd love to see one happen. So the, the last little bit is the one I thought was very, very cool. Um, and this is also something I've never seen in real life work. I mean, not that it doesn't work, um, but this is a thing called a video plankton recorder. And it's basically just a toad box that you pull through the water and it goes past a video camera. And it's really good for looking at bigger zooplankton like the copepods and the bigger larvae. Um, and so, Rob, what I thought I could finish with, if it's okay, and then open it up to questions, is there's a short video on YouTube by Cable Davis. Have they? Have you showed that yet at all? No, I haven't. But we okay, so if you don't mind, I'll switch over to YouTube and we'll watch that video because That's they give awesome. really a really nice um, instructional thing on the video, the VPR, and how it works. This is okay. awesome. Okay. <laughs> hey, I'm here to entertain, right? I didn't know you had those pictures of me. <laughs> All right, let's see. I'm going to escape and I'm going to go to, let's see, YouTube. Am I, am I still sharing my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's, I'm going to play this one. So this is not my university. 
students. I wish it was kind of, but this is from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And one of the, the person who really in, developed the, this thing that you tow to measure plankton, um, his name is Dr. Cable Davis and he or Cable, and he's, he's gonna talk about it. So I'll let him do the talking. So I don't see, we don't see the videos. Oh, the front end is a oh, video of plankton. Okay, just a We've got a camera over here in the nose. We've got a strobe light here in this wing pod. This instrument moves through the water at 10 knots. And we're taking a picture 30 times oh, a second, about the size of my little finger here. And so we get 30 snapshots of a volume this size every second. Can you see the small version? The just the, it's a white screen, screen at the moment. Six inches. Yeah, I couldn't tell what I was sharing. Sharing is pause. Bring your shared window to the front. Oh, hold that thought. I'm still yeah. working on uh, bring my shared window to the front. Shared window. Share. Okay, can you see that? Oh, yeah, now we're in business. All right, and then I'm going to play again and tell me if it disappears. Water. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> filming plankton in the size range from about a Okay. microns up to a centimeter in size and you see all kinds of different plankton in the water. On this trip we're particularly interested in the so how much is that instrument work? Colonies, cyanobacterial colonies that fix nitrogen that you heard explained before but they show Was it easier to see in the smaller? Um, yeah, maybe the smaller one. Yeah. yeah it has better resolution doesn't it? It's just up here. There we go. There we go. Really well with this camera system, and that's what we're trying to figure out here: is how abundant they are at different depths, how much nitrogen they fix, and this tool here allows us to look at the distributional patterns of these colonies over very long distances and very high resolution. Oops. Sorry, Down to the scale of centimeters and up to the length scales of the ocean basin. How much is that well, instrument worth? Water and the data is coming up through the fiber optic tow cable into the uh, acquisition system on the ship. This is the flight control screen here. This is the view that you would get if you were sitting inside the tow face looking out, flying it like an airplane. This flight control program allows us to undulate the instrument between the surface and 150 meters. On this cruise, we've been getting about three tip images per second. So all of these are little pictures of the plankton that get written to the disks in real time. We have another computer over here that is reading the disk, loading in these images, and we programmed it so that it processes the images, identifies what they are, and plots their distribution patterns as we're telling. Oh, we're getting an amazing amount of data from the VPR. It's been working really great. It's uh, giving us everything we hoped for, showing us where the trichodesmian patches are, the stopping where the patches are, giving everything to everybody that they want. There. And and that's the thank you to our sponsor, right? The NSF. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I don't right. know if you heard my question, but like how much is an instrument that, like of the VPR, how much would that be? Oh, you know what? That's a really good question. And I always joke that every oceanographic instrument that I ever want to purchase is um, $30,000. But I'm guessing that this, these are probably more on the order of 50 to 100K. I think it depends on what you get with it. But that's a, that's a good question. I wouldn't be shocked if it was more than 100K, but I'm not, abs I, I'm not absolutely sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I'm, always, I'm always saying to the, to the kids that, you know, science is not cheap, even if it's like buying a box of GFF filters or... Yep, yep. $75 for one box. <laughs> exactly, 75 yep. bucks. Yep. yep. Yeah, it's... Um, so, you know, Josh and Ryan Rikazeski, um, Ryan bought... Is it a VPR? No, it can't be. They bought something that they've been testing in Bermuda, and now I'm, I'm, having, I'm having a senior moment. I can't remember what it is. Did Josh mention it? Uh, no, he did not. It's a U. It's a UVP. UV UVP. Underwater, yeah, underwater vertical profiler. Profiler. Yeah, plankton. Yeah. underwater plankton profiler or something like yeah. that. Yeah, that's that's what they bought. 
yeah, yeah. that's awesome uh, that, that's a good one yeah um, so, so I, i'm open to questions yeah yeah so you guys got questions i i have a, a question that's more of a general sort of career question okay um so we have a lot of girls that are in our program and good. there's there's a lot of challenges that are faced in in any type of career like this but i'm just wondering if you have any advice for a girl wanting to get into you know oceanography marine right. science computer modeling coding right. that type of thing yeah. yeah well well number one go for it uh there's i think for, i think now um so let me let me let me say some one thing first so the kind of the neat thing that I've noticed um, when I first started in oceanography, it was kind of considered something that the boys do and the girls don't. And the neat thing is that over the last, you know, 20, 30 years, um, probably 75% of my undergraduate students are females now. Good. So the depth, it's, it's very much changing. And so it's, it's easily a career that, you know, uh, um, guys or girls can do it. I think now, so it's different now than it used to be. And I don't think there's as many impediments as there used to be. There is not the social expectations that, oh, you know, you can't do that. You're a girl. Um, and I don't know if the students noticed, but in one of those slides, and I'll send this, well, you've got the recording, but I can also send you the PowerPoint. Um, for example, on the Explorer, one of our marine technicians was Emily, who was a, a okay. girl. And she, you know, she stayed at sea for long periods of time. Now she wasn't married and she didn't have children. But the same goes for the men who are, you know, working as a marine technician. So it's, you know, it's your world, ladies. It's a, go for it. It's, you can do anything the boys can do. And I could say even better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah, and no, it's, 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 it, it works. It's, it's, what, it's what was your aha moment? Like what, what got you interested in the ocean? Was it something that sort of developed in college or? Yeah, so when um, I was an undergraduate, I was a biology student, and as, a, as an undergraduate, and this is in Canada, by the way, folks, so Rob didn't grow up in the U.S., and neither did I. I grew up in wow. Canada, <laughs> and um, so as part of my degree program, you had to do either a terrestrial field course or a marine biology field course. You had to do one or the other in order to graduate. And so originally I had checked the uh, terrestrial box, and but I was also a runner at the time, and I didn't want to, uh, I didn't, it turned out that I had a track meet that weekend and I couldn't go. Anyway, long story short, I ended up taking the marine biology course. And the first time I looked through a microscope at zooplankton, it probably was, it just blew my mind and I was hooked from there on in. It was just, I didn't realize that there were these things in the water that looked like this, <laughs> right? And I, I grew up pretty close to the ocean, but you just don't know if you've never looked through a microscope. That, that's so true. It's a very similar story for me. Yeah. And yeah. I had a very good professor who taught invertebrate zoology and mm -hmm. it just happened to be plankton, actually jelly week. And yeah. from there, the That's rest of the yeah. 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 So maybe, you know, if I had uh, not had a track meet the week that uh, I was supposed to go in the terrestrial field course, I would have been interested in frogs or snakes, but I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a favorite like memory from a research cruise? Like what, what do you like most about, what you do i love i love going to the field i like going to sea for short periods of time i get a little stir crazy if i'm there for more than a week but you know as long as i'm keeping busy um favorite memories definitely one of them is the cruise on the rv Kayo, which is why partly why i put that in there and when they were looking at this laser induced fluorescence i never had a good feel for the fact that there were so many gelatinous things in the ocean but boy, when those things lit up, when they put that laser, it was a green laser, I think, that they would shoot down through the ship and all the sea lit up. And you can see these organisms and it just, it blew my mind. I, yeah. So that was probably another like, wow moment that convinced me that I was doing the right thing. By that time, I was a PhD student and I pretty much committed myself to this career. But yeah, so that's one of them. Oh, you're muted, Rob. All right. D hey. As far as, do you have any questions, Scott? Cynthia? I actually got to go right now real quick. I have to go somewhere at 3. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, Hi. Um, nice to have you. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, well, this has been awesome, Tammy. Really, really enjoyed this. Well, I'm glad. I did yes. too. And it's amazing. Like an hour, just, it just goes. 
I know, boom. I know. And then I thought, ooh, do I have too many slides? But this is good. It's easy when you've got good material to go with. <laughs> well, it's certainly I enjoy talking about it, and it's a subject that, as you know, I have to go now, bye. Yeah. I have to go. Oh. Yes, to go so, to uh, Cyrus. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Well, yeah, we can wrap it up. But feel free; they can send me an email, or we can do another Zoom call any day. I'm I'm here, and yeah. as long as I'm not committed to click to class, then I'm good to go. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you again you're for welcome. your time today, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, we we you're welcome back anytime. We might take All you right. up on that offer. Cool. That's All right, cool. guys. Have fun. Thanks.